the first Emmanuel Levinas lecture hosted at uh, the Psychology and the Other Institute, which is housed at Lesley University. Uh, and also, Beth Chambers was kind enough to invite us to give this as a part of the Gender and Sexual Violence Awareness Week here at Lesley. So thank you and all your work helping you set this up. I appreciate that a lot. Um, just really quick before I introduce Dr. Pellegrini, what are the Emmanuel Levinas lectures? Uh, I'll start and hopefully not bore you too much with just a couple minutes of background about who this man was and why we are naming a lecture series after him. Um, he's a, some people would refer to him as a fairly obscure Lithuanian philosopher. His life spanned for most of the 20th century and he lost the majority of his family in the Holocaust. And he himself spent five years in a work camp um, during the entirety of World War II. Uh, his philosophy, if I can try to describe it, is a philosophy that tries to understand and uncover the ways that we protect ourselves from each other, uh, the ways that we cover over our experiences of one another so as not to be utterly and absolutely overwhelmed and affected by what your face and your need does to me, and how it, what it calls upon out of me, um, and that we constantly find ways to try to reduce that, maintain that, and, and keep ourselves in equilibrium. And so his work was one that uh, had a hope in it that the world and the systems and the communities and the relationships we live in could actually be places that call us beyond complacency. Uh, that they can be places where our inherited logics um, get turned into what Jacques Derrida, one of his students, referred to as the logic of the beyond. And uh, so the le these lectures, it's our hope at least, could be a place where um, we get dislocated from our meanings that become overly habitual and secure, and that we get relocated into a calling towards a greater love and responsiveness to each other. Um, and I can think of very, very, very few people that I'd rather inaugurate these lectures than Dr. Ann Pellegrini. Um, she comes to us from uh, NYU, where she is the, um, uh, the director of the Center of, of for the study of gender and sexuality, right? Uh, also associate professor of performance studies and religious studies there. Uh, at this point, she's in Cambridge as uh, Harvard University Charles War Warner Center for Studies in American History Fellow, uh, where she's completing like 17 books at the same time. Is that about right? Um, currently working on about two books. Titles seem absolutely intriguing. One is uh, You Can Tell Just by Looking and 20 Other Myths About LGBT Life and People. And the other book is Excess and Enchantment, Queer Performance Between the Religious and the Secular. Um, she's an incredibly rad person. That's, she has a mind unlike most I've ever met, so I'm excited that she can be here and bring us into this conversation. So without further ado, Dr. Pellegrini. Thank you, Dave, for that incredibly generous introduction. Uh, and I'm so grateful to be here this evening. And, well, hi. Huge appreciation to David Goodman for the invitation to speak to you, to Beth Chambers for uh, inviting me to, to take part in this uh, week's important series of events to call attention to, um, to violence and its prevention. And some of what I have to say this evening may seem counterintuitive to the project or to the hope of actually preventing violence. So to anticipate and cut to my chase, um, among other things, I'll be suggesting the limits of appeals to tolerance as a way to lessen the social divisions that so often erupt into outright violence. And I'll also be propose, proposing the need for more conflict, not less. But I get ahead of myself and my argument, so let's back up and start over from the top. And points afterwards so anyone who knows what movie I just quoted. Okay. <laughs> no Judy Garland fans, clearly. <laughs> I I should close my computer and go home now. Um, I'm having a hissy homosexual fit. Okay. All right, in, in her now classic 1981 essay, the uses of anger. Lesbian feminist poet and essayist Audre Lorde calls out guilt, and she's writing specifically about white feminist guilt. She calls out guilt as, in her words, a device to protect ignorance and the continuation of things the way they are, the ultimate protection for changelessness. This is guilt as a deflection of the other's experience and one's implication in it. She goes on, over the course of this essay, to dare women of color to upset the feminist fantasy of unity without difference or difference of opinion by urging women of color to name and speak their anger aloud and by challenging white feminists to hear it, to hear this anger without getting defensive. 
without, to go back to Levinas, turning their face away. Lord writes, the angers between women will not kill us if we can anticipate them with precision, if we listen to the content of what is said with at least as much intensity as we defend ourselves against the manner of saying. When we turn from anger, we turn from insight, saying we will accept only designs already known, deadly, and safely familiar. Lord's charge to make productive political and, I'd add, psychic use of anger was and remains a radical act. So this assertion about the contemporary value of anger and the need for still more of it may seem somewhat counterfactual at a time in American life when we're constantly hearing um, that the big problem we're facing is the polarization of American public discourse and that it's reached all-time highs. We hear about the feedback loop between the spleen venting titans of talk radio, Rush Limbaugh, anyone, and the listeners who tune in and call in, and we hear how it regenerates or reinforces a larger culture of public feelings whose baseline is self-righteous resentment, delirious demonization, and an all-round disunited states. Paradoxically, alongside this particular narrative of dysfunctional America split into red versus blue, us versus them, we commonly hear another and ostensibly more hopeful story. In this story, we hear from pundits and politicians that Americans, or at least some fabled American center, um, Nan Hunter, who's a legal scholar, refers to this as the lunatic center, right? Um, holding American politics hostage, right? We hear that Americans, or at least some fabled American center, actually hate partisan rhetoric and desire consensus and above all, civil discourse. Now, one of the many interesting things about this claim that actually Americans are longing for civil discourse and consensus. One of the many interesting things about this claim is that it's often made at the very guise of disqualifying one's opponent. I'm so reasonable, my opponent's not. So it ends up being a kind of rhetorical game um, so that one can sort of aggrandize oneself morally while actually asserting uh, an inflexible opinion. So it's, uh, I'm less interested in that kind of rhetorical um, deployment of a call for civility than um, what I would provisionally call the psychic underbelly the psychic underbelly of these calls for civility, these calls for consensus as what we most need. Now, what do I mean by speaking of the psychic underbelly and pointing to the viscera, the visceral life of public feeling? The call for civility and consensus can sometimes, not always, but pretty frequently, right? The call for civility and consensus can sometimes actually cover up and continue long-standing power imbalances and social inequalities. This is because calls for civility are frequently yoked to the notion that in political life and in other spheres of human relating too, no one's feelings should ever be hurt. This is certainly a fantasy where the schoolyard and family dinner table are concerned, not to mention romantic life. I hope you all had a nice Valentine's Day. <laughs> but it's a fantasy about the conduct of political life, and especially it's a fantasy about how we disagree with each other over morally charged issues. And what such disagreement feels like, the dream of consensus above all may actually block possibilities for vibrant and truly inclusive democratic life. It could also block our possibilities to see each other's face in anger, in hurt, in rage, in anxiety, in ugliness, in paranoia, in suspicion. We can't just look at the face when it's pretty. So much depends on what we're consenting to. And who is or is or and who is or is not part of that we of the faces we will recognize in public and in private too? What if we risk getting angry with each other, risk exposing and expressing our ugly feelings of anxiety, suspicion, even hate, risk making others uncomfortable and being made so in turn? What might incivility and ugly feelings tell us about democracy and its discontents with all due thanks and apologies to Freud? <coughs> to understate. Democracy does not always feel good, but discomfort is not always, or necessarily, a bad thing. A qualification. There are uses of, uses of anger, and there are uses of anger. They're not all equivalent. I, too, worry about a politics by demonization, in which name-calling stands in for argumentation. And I want to point out, and it's important for us to think about the ways in which feelings do not occur in a vacuum. They have a political and social history, as well as a psychic or internal life. 
But this does not mean that my feelings are my feelings alone and emanate from me as some sort of private property and are immune to critique or analysis. I want to push us to think together about feelings, what we could also call affects or emotions, as events or electric currents that flow between people, are shared, are shareable. I want to come back later to this idea about the transmission or shareability of affect and why this can help us think about violence differently. For now, I want to say that too often calls to mollify, repair, or just plain avoid hurt feelings come to function as kind of institutionalized forgetting of the social structures and histories of inequality within which feelings circulate and attach to people and to particular hot button topics, flashing up around certain clusters of issues more frequently than around some others, especially, I think, around issues of embodiment. As a consequence, the need to repair the hurt feelings of some becomes an end unto itself, elevated above the promotion of substantive equality and social justice for some others. Think back to Audre Lorde's diagnosis of white feminist guilt and its evasions. Might the call for civility be another and related device to protect ignorance and the continuation of things the way they are? This is actually a long-standing issue in American life. We can hear its strains in the majority opinion in Plessy v. Ferguson, the infamous 1896 Supreme Court case that held that separate was equal. How do people know about the case of Plessy v. Ferguson? A few do, so maybe I'll just say a few words about it. So this is a case that came to the court in 1896. Um, it affirmed the idea that separate was equal. It came about, uh, it had to do with the issue of um, segregated rail cars in, in the state of Louisiana and whether or not this uh, was an unconstitutional violation of the promise of equal protection under the 14th Amendment. Um, and one of the really interesting things about this case, so the segregation had to do with a car, that, um, a whites-only car. So African-Americans could not go into a whites-only car. But can you always tell by looking? Because African-American is black. The law, the, the segregated rail car, was premised on the idea that you could tell by looking. So how do you then get a legal action if you can tell by looking? So one of the really fascinating backstories of this case is that Homer Plessy was, an, uh, was by law defined as black, but could pass as white. So he had to pass as white to go onto a white's only car and then declare himself as black, out himself, so he could be arrested. Right? So this Supreme Court case, which affirmed the principle of separate is equal, no problem. Right? So it affirmed segregation is constitutionally permissible. But it can only happen because of a performance of passing, of racial passing. And um, there, actually, there are numerous important legal cases in the United States history to do with race that actually required first a kind of performative event. It actually, uh, people had to make something happen in order to get the, the, the law to actually listen to them. Uh, but it's just interesting to think about the ways in which um, um, law sometimes needs to be really scratched to even to get its attention. Um, and we can talk some more about why this might matter, how we think about the law later. Right, so the court affirms in an 8 to 1 decision that separate is in fact equal. And towards the end of his majority opinion, Justice Brown, ironic name, Justice Brown offered an answer to the question how to tell the difference between a law that promotes the public good, which would be constitutionally permissible, and one that was enacted for the annoyance or oppression of a particular class, which would not be under the terms of the 14th Amendment. It would violate equal protection if it singled out a particular class on the basis of race. So the short answer to this dilemma, how do we tell the difference between good law, because it promotes the public good, and bad law, because it, it's enacted specifically for the annoyance or oppression of a particular class, the short answer to this question was reasonableness. Okay. And this is now the justice's language. In determining the question of reasonable, reasonableness, because how do we know? According to whom, right? So in determining the question of reasonable, reasonableness, the state is at liberty to act with reference to the established usages, customs, and traditions of the people, and with a view to the promotion of their comfort and the preservation of the public peace and good order. Right. So you look to the established usages, customs, and traditions of the people, and what you look for when you look at that, oh, how do we promote the comfort and preservation of the public peace and good order? Hmm. All right. Now, slight problem. Whose good order, whose comfort is at stake? As my colleague Karen Shimakawa has explained, Justice Brown's appeal to the established traditions of the people, which people count, 
and majority's ongoing comfort serves to justify and explain the difference between reasonable laws and unreasonable discrimination, a distinction that reduces reasonableness to the comfort of the dominant center. In this equation, reasonableness equals what makes the dominant class feel good, including good about themselves, misrecognizes what substantive equality in the context of pluralism demands. It also divides us from them. In the specific context of Plessy, a case to do with racial segregation, this us-them division meant a brutal cut between a dominant white majority whose comfort became the ultimate object of the Supreme Court's concern, the ultimate measure of reasonableness, and a minoritized racial other. And I'm saying minoritized um, because I think it's important um, to use the language of minoritization rather than racial minority. Because if we say racial minority, we're accepting this first as a fixed demographic, and we know demographics in the United States are changing. But we also need to think of minoritization as an ongoing process that actually relegates some bodies to a status as lesser, to the margins, even if they might not, in fact, be lesser in numbers. And certainly are not lesser in terms of the moral status they can claim on us. Women are actually minoritized with respect to social and political power, even though we are a majority of the US population. So minoritization gets at the activity, social processes of relegation, rather than accepting sort of um, some sort of brute fact that, that, not, that just counting bodies will tell us what's happening. It won't. Now, in sharp contrast to this result, right, in which the comfort of the majority is elevated against substantive equality for everyone else, right, um, my colleague Karen Shemakawa has called for a proliferation of comforts. Right? I love the difficulty even of saying that, a proliferation of comforts. It's awkward English, and I think that's really important sometimes to go with awkward um, locutions. It points out the strangeness of actually what we're already living with. So the strangeness of the language actually points to the strangeness of the now, what defamiliarizes our present. So how might we cultivate the capacity, individually and collectively, to proliferate comforts, which actually means to bear the discomfort and presence of difference in the world we share with others? If you proliferate comforts, this actually means you're also proliferating discomforts. The legal logic, if not the social practice, is separate but equal, would at last be overturned in Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. Right, so the court there, that also a case to do, here a case to do with segregated schools, right? But the demand, and the demand that has the force of a shared cultural logic, that the feelings of the majority and the preservation of their established traditions must be protected and comforted persists in ways that are deeply disabling for democracy and social justice for all. And even, and this is very interesting, if you read the decision of Brown v. Board of Education, even Brown's laudable concerns with African-American children's, and I'll quote from the decision, Brown, among other things, was concerned with African-American children's, quote, feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone, right? So they're, they're, among other things, they saw that one of, the, one of the substantive effects of segregated schools was to instill in African-American children a sense of their inferiority, and that this was actually um, in one of the inequality effects. And that's an important observation. But, it, um, but the problem with this observation is if it makes the question of fixing feelings out to be the purpose of the law. Because you can fix feelings without fixing structure, right? And, and later I'll point out, I'll point to moments where actually there's a discrepancy between feelings of oppression and actual oppression, right? So this, the, what happened in Brown is really significant because of the way it embedded the question of a feeling into what a law of inequality was about, fixing inequality. Um, and this confusion of feelings with substantive equality, again, I think is deeply problematic. Contemporary calls for civility as well as the public feeling culture that converts such calls into a universal moral imperative are haunted by these decidedly uncivil wars of race, national belonging, and the lived meaning of what it is to share space with each other and bump up against people different from ourselves. Let me offer a more recent and very bumpy example. In 2010, the otherwise quite unexceptional approval granted by the New York City Zoning Board to build a multi-use Islamic community center, then known as the Cordova Center, and now officially called Park 51, on the site of the former Burlington Coat Factory, a department store, two blocks from where the World Trade Center buildings once stood in downtown Manhattan, this zoning permission ignited a firestorm. Opponents of the project, ginned up by much internet activism, denounced the desecration in their language of a hallowed space, a department store, of national mourning, and stamped this association in the public mind by reducing the multi-use Islamic center to one function and one function only, a mosque, and by renaming it the Ground Zero Mosque. 
This coup of misnaming stuck, and it helped to set the ugly terms for all the bait and switches to follow. Congressman Peter King, a Republican from New York State, was a leading opponent of the project. He also led congressional hearings about the same time and the dangers of what he called homegrown Muslim terrorists, a bit of political theater that itself demonstrates the dangerous power of public feelings to construct and maintain an us-them division. In August 2010, amidst the storm of controversy over plans for the center, Congressman King publicly called for Muslims to cancel their plans to build on a space so filled with suffering and grief for all Americans. Except, he implied, he didn't say this outright, but except, he implied, for Muslim Americans who become a conceptual impossibility under the terms of his language. Instead, they are the Muslim community. There's no hyphen. There's no possibility of Muslim American community. They're the Muslim community. And they're cast as apart from, not a part of, the suffering whole. Drawing in a language of hurt feelings, the congressman said, quote, it is insensitive and uncaring for the Muslim community to build a mosque in the shadow of ground zero. While the Muslim community has the right to build a mosque, they are abusing that right by needlessly offending so many people who have suffered so much. Evidently, no Muslim Americans have suffered at all. The congressman's remarks are illustrative, not exceptional. They are one example of what happens when a call to repair her feelings is made without reference to existing social hierarchies, divisions of power, histories of inequality. In such an instance, the feelings of some people must be protected, even if that means running roughshod over the rights of some others. If some Muslim Americans come away from this debate with hurt feelings or even limited free exercise rights, freedom of religion anyway, <coughs> that is just the price they must pay for, will it be eventual acceptance? What this debate also misses is that injured feelings are an unavoidable part of our lives with others. It's actually okay for, them, for Muslim Americans to have their feelings hurt there, just as it's all right for everybody else to, as well. Um, focusing a debate around hurt feelings misses out on far more substantive questions. This doesn't mean, by the way, we should go out of the way to be rude and hurtful. That's a different issue. Right? Hurt, because hurt feelings are not the great equalizer. The subjective experience of hurt or injured feelings does not cancel out the need for an historical and political mapping of the way hurt feelings are linked to and rearticulate differences in social power. The answer to hurt feelings, though, is not political correctness. Political correctness, whether of the left or right or right hand of God, is a set of slogans. It is a far cry from cultivating the capacity, individually and collectively, across our lifetimes, to bear disagreement in irresolvable differences and this is a capacity to argue we have to keep cultivating. It's not a once-for-all job. This capacity, this cultivation to bear disagreement and irresolvable differences is even our very starting place with others, not to mention our originary launching point if we are to be a self in some way distinguishable from an other at all. Liberalism gives lip service to being different. I don't mean liberalism, by the way, in the sense of Democrats or Republicans, I mean in terms of the notion of the liberal state and the way it makes room for difference. Liberalism gives lip service to being different, but in a secular version of love the sinner, hate the sin. Too often difference is admitted into public life on the condition that it appear as more of the same. As in, I'm okay, you're okay, but could your way keep out of my way? Another term for this structure of feeling is tolerance. It may even be the U.S. national feeling. Feelings, nothing more than feeling. Say along. <laughs> Pretty much everybody is on board with tolerance across the political spectrum. Even the Southern Poverty Law Center, the group probably most responsible for bringing hate groups of the Ku Klux Klan to justice, advises us to, in their words, teach tolerance as a way to fight hateful violence. So what's wrong with tolerance? Who could object to it? I kind of have some problems with tolerance. And this is an issue Janet Jacobson and I discuss at length in our book, Love the Sin, Sexual Regulation and the Limits of Religious Tolerance. Our argument there in brief is that although American common sense valorizes tolerance as a response to violence and social division, in actual practice, tolerance works to affirm social hierarchies by establishing an us-them relationship between a dominant center and those on the margins. This structure, in which a dominant majority grants rights of sufferance or no to its various margins, is in many ways a secular version of religious toleration in which an established church allows dissenters the right to worship without fear of persecution, but withholds from them equivalent public or civic rights and privileges. There's actually nothing surprising in this. Um, the history of tolerance in the United States is inseparable from the history of religion. Co 
concepts of religious tolerance were developed in Europe in response to the so-called wars of religion that were sparked by the Protestant Reformation. The American principles of religious freedom enshrined in the First Amendment, enshrined before even perhaps the better known First Amendment freedom of, freedom of speech, these American principles of um, religious freedom were supposed to overcome these limits of toleration with an established church at the center, giving some goodies to the margins but not full, right? It was supposed to overcome these limits of toleration by providing for the equal treatment of different faiths. Uh, it did so because the, these two linked clauses under the First Amendment religious freedom were following. There is no established church, and all religions are free to practice as they please, stress on practice. And in actual practice, however, these twin promises of religious freedom have run up against two conflicting notions of American national identity. The first is that this is a nation of religious freedom, including the freedom not to be religious at all. But the second is that this is a basically Christian nation, highest occasional invocations of Judeo-Christian notwithstanding. Judeo-Christian is a term that dates back. It's a 20th century term that in part was a response to anti-Semitism, but it does not, in fact, describe the reality of, um, of the embeddedness of Christian values, of specific Christian ideas in US national life. Professions of tolerance mixed with stern moral judgment are a routine feature of political life in the United States. When President George W. Bush finally came out, no, not in that way, when he finally came out in February 2004, in favor, you thought it was like news, news flash, right? Um, when he finally came out in February 2004, in favor of a federal constitutional amendment to ban same-sex marriage, a move that would create a permanent constitutional underclass. This was extraordinary. It would be the first time that the Constitution was amended to actually make a group an outgroup. The Constitution has been amended historically to bring up groups in, never to produce an outgroup, unless you want to think of bootleggers as a group that was produced as such under prohibition. That's an interesting question. Um, I've been promised a martini after this talk, so I have an investment in that answer. Um, right, so when he, he comes out in February not 2004 in favor of a constitutional amendment to ban same-sex marriage, which would create a permanent constitutional underclass, he nonetheless concludes his remarks, public address, right, with a call for, in his words, kindness and goodwill and decency. So you just called for making a group of your fellow citizens a constitutional underclass permanently, but let's conduct this debate with kindness and goodwill and decency. What are we to make of this political equation in which personal kindness and civility are traded for public justice? Is this a matter of hypocrisy, political rhetoric? It could, of course, be both of these things. But in our work together, Janet Jacobson and I are interested in the work tolerance performs for the dominant center, who are the real targets of the president's speech. President Bush was not speaking to LGBT people. They were not the targets of his address. He wasn't speaking to self-identified progressives. They were not the targets of his address. Um, many political moderates, and some liberals too, are uncomfortable with same-sex marriage. But they're also uncomfortable with the idea of appearing intolerant, and even being intolerant, not just appearing, being intolerant of their gay friends and neighbors. Perhaps this balance is shifting, results from the November elections in which voters re-elected a different president who has evolved publicly to support same-sex marriage, and voters in four states effectively supported same-sex marriage. These results suggest major shifts may be underway. However, we know from polling that one out of four Americans is still opposed to any legal recognition of same-sex couples. And let's just see what happens when the Supreme Court rules in the two same-sex marriage cases it will be hearing this term. Not just how it will rule, but what will be the public response to its rulings. One of these cases concerns the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, which defines marriage as the union of one man and one woman and bans any federal recognition, actually one man and one woman at a time, right? Because it doesn't allow divorce, right? um, which is, uh, thank, um, I know that many, many congressmen are relieved of that, right? Um, so it defines marriage as the union of one man and one woman and bans any federal recognition of same-sex marriage. DOMA passed in 1996 with large bipartisan majorities in both the House and Senate, and it was signed into law by President Bill Clinton, a Democrat, right? So at last, here was an issue in which Democrats and Republicans could unite, it was the need to defend marriage. But defended against what or whom? Can a parade of well-dressed same-sex couples walking up the aisle or to their local marriage registry really end Western civilization as we know it? And if so, would the gays please hurry up and do so before tax day on April 15th? Right? Um, and you know, one of the really extraordinary things, um, 
of uh, about this uh, the fear of what gay marriage will do to Western civilization, and, um, and these are not you know this fear is not what I'm making up. I'm sure you've all heard versions of it. We heard Rick Santorum, the former Republican hopeful for the presidency, speaking in Washington State in advance of that state's um, referendum in November, worrying about the disintegration that gay marriage would cause to our nation. Um, the, the voters of the state of Washington did not listen to Rick Santorum. They voted to hold same-sex marriage there and bring on the disintegration, right? But um, it's really interesting. How, really, how would same-sex marriage cause the disintegration of, of marriage and family in this nation? So a really interesting set of questions. I'm happy to talk to you about it some more. But one of the, one of the in many, the vast claims um, is that um, it somehow de it devalues traditional marriage as if marriage is this limited franchise. <laughs> that only a few people have access to, and in fact, that's quite contrary, because right? marriage is promoted as the universal value that we should all want, such that many lesbian gay people want it too, right? So in fact, the value of marriage franchise is precisely that everyone is supposed to want it, not by its limitation, as Las Vegas drive through weddings um, suggest to us, right? So that argument doesn't make any sense, but another one is that if, if we could let gay people marry, it will somehow be the end of civilization because um, this will stop reproducing as a species. Which I just find shocking because, I mean, first of all, it denies the reality that many lesbian gay families, right? Um, it also denies the reality that, if anything, this, this planet has a heck of a lot of, uh, of, of evidence of repopulation. Um, but further, the, the logic behind it is the idea that once it becomes possible for gay people to marry, you're basically everyone's going to want to go gay. Those are the better weddings. So suddenly, you know, you have this sort of heterosexual kind of thing, like, eh, I don't know, should I get married? I can marry a guy, says the guy. I can marry a gal, says the gal. I mean, it's just, it's like, if I could have had the V8 model of sexuality, I had no idea, and now I can. Um, so it's a very odd set of uh, concerns. But, you know, the, the arguments aren't about logic, because fear, anxiety, panic are not about logic. And I would also argue that the, much of the anxiety about same sex marriage has nothing to do with homosexuality. It does for some people who are religiously opposed to homosexuality, but for many, many people, the, the problem with same-sex marriage is actually about the transformation of marriage and the economic insecurity of all family formations in neoliberalism. And so same-sex marriage and gay people become scapegoats for much larger processes of social change, which have rendered um, so many families um, at risk. One paycheck away for being homeless, one paycheck away, or one health care emergency away from um, being unable to pay a mortgage pay a rent, right? So again, the sort of scapegoating, um, there's a swarm of, you know, sort of worries and anxieties about same-sex marriage, which actually are not about same-sex marriage, but there's a kind of stand-in that happens. Um, and, you know, psychoanalysis can actually help us think about this, unlike probably any other um, theoretical body of work we have. Right? Um, bring it back. Okay. So this administration of our current Democratic President, Barack Obama, has announced his desire to repeal DOMA. Nevertheless, the idea that marriage equality imperils traditional marriage still feels true to so many people. And again, it feels true for reasons that are not specific to moral objections to homosexuality, though I recognize many people have sincere moral objections to homosexuality on religious grounds. And I am not to dis dismiss it of those objections, even if I might disagree profoundly. Um, but even think about the, the sort of the sense that t traditional marriage is under attack. This is evident even in the name of the 19 1996 federal law, the Defense of Marriage Act. It was not called the Let's Discriminate Against Gay Couples Act. That would not have been a good seller, right? You could say this is just branding, right? You don't get a law through Congress if you say, admit, wait, hey, we're openly discriminating. Instead, you wait, wait, and call it the Defense of Marriage Act. But it's more than that. People really felt like they were defending something imperiled, right? Um, actually, again, there is much that is imperiled in US national life, um, but for different reasons than a bunch of um, same sex couples that actually wish to have the 1,200 federal and state benefits that come with the recognition, uh, the civil recognition of marriage. The fact still remains that on the same-sex marriage question, as around many other divisive social and cultural issues in American public life, and especially those that have to do with sex, in part it argued because sex is one of those places of bodily vulnerability where we most radically encounter others, and it recalls to us the bodily vulnerability of our life with others full stop. Sex becomes a kind of panic button around larger questions of our creatureliness, the ways in which we are beings who change over time. Right? So sex is, represents the urgency of this, and it's a way also to bottleneck these questions, these larger questions of capacity um, over a lifetime, connection to others, dependence on others, and how that changes over a lifetime. Right? Um, on questions of moral urgency, people of goodwill can take positions that are punitive towards their fellow citizens, while at the same time experiencing themselves as basically good people, 
morally glamorous, in the words of Kathleen Skerritt. Morally glamorous, people who are compassionate and even tolerant of difference. This too is a reason why I think tolerance is a problem. And what of those who are the objects of this finely measured glamorous tolerance? Frankly, this homosexual would prefer justice and formal and uh, substantive equality to the personal kindness and goodwill and decency of smiling neighbors. Democracy does not require that we agree with each other, let alone like each other. The point Jacobson and I, who like each other a great deal, make in our joint work and separately as well. In a democracy, social cohesion is built by interaction among those who disagree with each other, not by the expectation we agree all the way through, let alone by setting some viewpoints and some people outside the frame of possibility from the start. Civility, nice. Social justice, priceless. Right, I want to show you. Um, a video um, that was made in 2008 as part of the campaign in California to do with Proposition 8. Um, probably are we familiar with Proposition 8 by now? That's one of the cases coming before the Supreme Court this spring to do with Proposition 8. Um, and when you watch this video, it's about four minutes. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, it's had a quarter of a million hits. Um, it was made by proponents of Proposition 8. So if you voted for Proposition 8, you were voting to change the California Constitution to define um, same-sex marriage is impermissible, because you're defining marriage as between one man and one woman. Um, listen for the one invocation, explicit invocation in this video, in this ad, it's a political ad, a public service announcement. Listen for the word tolerance, it's going to be used explicitly once, and, and, and think about whether or not, in this moment, tolerance is being invoked as a good thing or a bad thing. So listen for the word. But listen underneath the words for something else, um, listen for the larger, we can call it, affective economy of the ad. How is this ad directing you to feel about this issue? And how might the ad actually be directing you to feel tolerance, even as it's disavowing tolerance at the level of language, right? I hope that makes sense. Um, and you might, there, we're, I'm going to take a break after we watch this and talk together about what you've seen and heard in it. Um, it's, uh, I, I show this ad at least twice a year, um, and I just find it fascinating and endlessly repays um, conversation about it. Okay. In the year 2000, Californians voted yes on legislation to define marriage as being between a man and a woman. In May 2008, four San Francisco judges overturned this legislation, ruling it unconstitutional. Suddenly, same-sex marriage was legal in California, but have the courts gone too far? And is same-sex marriage the right choice for California? On November 4th, Californians will have the chance to make their voices heard once more. This is Proposition 8, in plain English. Proposition 8 is a measure on the November ballot which will amend the California Constitution by adding these 14 words. Only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. A yes vote will reverse the Supreme Court's decision and restore traditional marriage to California. A no vote will affirm the Supreme Court's decision and allow same-sex marriage to continue in California. As with most political issues, there are strong feelings on both sides. Those in favor of the amendment argue that strong families are fundamental to society and legalizing same-sex marriage could have harmful consequences. Those opposed to the amendment argue that same-sex marriage is a right and won't harm anyone. There are also many people in the middle who aren't quite sure what to think. Meet Jan and Tom. Jan and Tom have two children and a dog. They own a minivan. Tom mows his lawn on Saturday. Jan likes to cook. Jan and Tom live next door to Dan and Michael, a same-sex couple. Jan and Tom have been good friends with Dan and Michael for years. When Jan and Tom were on vacation, Dan and Michael watched their dog. When Dan was sick, Jan brought him soup. When they first heard about Proposition 8, Tom and Jan felt torn. On the one hand, they believed in and wanted to teach their children traditional family values. On the other hand, they felt Dan and Michael should be treated fairly and equally, regardless of their lifestyle choice. Tom and Jan wondered, will same-sex marriage affect us and our children? They decided to find out. After a few minutes on the internet, Tom discovered section 297 of the California Family Code. That's interesting, thought Tom as he read it. It appears that same-sex couples like Dan and Michael, who are in a domestic partnership, already have the same legal rights and privileges as married couples. If this isn't about rights and equality, then what is it about? And why is changing the definition of marriage such a big deal? At that very moment, Jan was on the phone with her sister Nancy, who lives in Massachusetts, the only other state in the U.S. to legalize same-sex marriage. 
Here's what Jan learned. Fact. In 2004, Massachusetts legalized same-sex marriage. Fact. In 2006, a Massachusetts teacher read the story King and King to her second grade class, which told the story of a prince marrying a prince. When parents objected, courts ruled that parents had no right to receive advance notice that their children would be taught about gay marriage, nor could they pull their children from class. Fact. In 2006, Catholic Charities ended its adoption work in Massachusetts after more than 100 years of service because the state's anti-discrimination laws required adoption agencies to place children in same-sex homes. Tom was now starting to understand. Changing the definition of marriage was a big deal and could have some very serious consequences. Consequences that would affect not only their children, but also their community. If Proposition 8 were to fail, would their church be required to perform same-sex marriages? What would their children be taught in school? Could anti-discrimination laws force citizens to compromise their values and beliefs in the name of tolerance? Was same-sex marriage really the right choice for California? Tom and Jan decided there was far too much at stake to leave these questions to chance. Tom and Jan are still good friends with Dan and Michael. In fact, they're having a barbecue together right now. You see, being a good neighbor is important, but Tom and Jan have come to an important realization. They can respect Dan and Michael's lifestyle choice without affirming and embracing their lifestyle. Tom and Jan will be voting yes this November on Proposition 8, and we hope you'll do the same. For more information, please visit whatisprop8.com. Massachusetts, the state where all the trouble began. I'm from Massachusetts, so go Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> although whenever I come here, I think my parents would have forced me to sort of shotgun marriage, right? We've got a nice girl for you. Um, so uh, what, what did you, what did you um, hear and see? It's a pretty, I mean, it's a really simple ad visually, right? But it's very, I think it's incredibly, myself, I think it's really smart um, in terms of what it's doing rhetorically and the way it's trying to move you to feel. Did you, what did you hear when tolerance was mentioned? Did you hear that one? In the Compromising location? values for in the sake of tolerance. Right, okay. So tolerance here what is explicitly contrasted to morality, our ability to hold on to the values, traditional values we believe in. Um, and yet, I mean, one of the things I was suggesting is that there's, but it's actually nonetheless deploying tolerance. That's how you're supposed to feel about yourself when you vote for a proposition, yes. Yes, and eight at the end, right? Because you still, then you get to have a barbecue with Dan and Michael who just voted against their full enfranchisement, at least in the state of California. But you get to, but you're still best besties, right? With having burgers, nice, you know, and have some ketchup, great burgers, right? You're, and um, they're looking after your dog. You trust, you trust this game off of your dog. So great. So it also makes sense that they would be able to frame it in that way. It's like, sure, you can have, you can be fine with gay, with the, with the, the gay couple. Um, because they have the same rights. I mean, they made that statement they have the same rights because the state law in California allows for the state to recognize their the domestic partnership, but it says nothing about the federal um, benefits right. to. Um, and that was actually correct. At, at the state level, because of DOMA, so the federal government under DOMA cannot recognize same sex marriages, um, that you know, in the state of Massachusetts, there are no federal benefits can go to same sex couples who are married in the state of Massachusetts, right? So, it, it, that part was factually correct. That at the level that what Proposition legally nothing had changed for same sex couples. Um, at some level, nothing had changed in terms of the benefits they could get access to because they could still register as domestic partners in the state of California and get the same benefits they got by virtue of being legally married in the state of California because the benefits were all coming from the state. So that part was factually correct. There are many incorrect assertions made um, in this ad, but that was actually true. But of course, many people would argue that same-sex marriage is more than just about legal benefits, it's also about symbolic, the symbolism of marriage, which um, as the story in Nancy Cott, who teaches at Harvard, has said, there's nothing like marriage but marriage. It's everything that has accrued to it over the years, which isn't to say that marriage is a stable institution, its meaning has changed dramatically, historically, even just over the last you know, five decades in the US. Um, you know, until 1967, it was legal to deny interracial couples the right to marry. Miscegenation laws were not struck down as unconstitutional until 1967, right? Um, but 
it's, it is certainly, you know, one could argue that um, the desire for same-sex marriage is, is, has to do with far more than, you know, getting state, state benefits, of which there are a considerable number, of course. Uh, what, what else did you notice when they added? What about gender, maybe? Yes. Oh, I was just going to say um, the tolerance. They said, like, anti-discrimination groups, something, something, something in the name of tolerance. And it just right. sounded like right. anti-discrimination groups were a bad thing yes. in general. Yeah. So it's a, it was interesting. Yeah, good pick up on your, the ears there. Because so they're positioning anti-discrimination laws as one that would trump the traditional values, the moral values, actually, of individual families and what they decide is right to teach their children in the name of tolerance, right? These anti-discrimination laws will force us to compromise our values in the name of tolerance. Um, and one of the really interesting things about that, and it's a wonderful that you, you heard that, um, part of the background for, the, for um, this particular ad and the way it works is that the um, conservative, social conservatives have been very successful since the 1990s at um, reconstructing, telling a story about um, LGBT, um, the LGBT rights movement as a movement for special rights. Now, have people heard this language of special rights? So the claim is that when LGBT people say, we need protection from discrimination, right? we need an, you know, a law that protects us from, from discrimination in work and housing and financial institutions, um, that would, so basically we need basically to be equal before the law. Conservatives have managed to reframe this as a claiming of special rights. Um, and this language special rights, which was initially developed to describe um, lesbian and gay uh, um, calls for equality and then LGBT calls for equality, has actually started to drift a little bit. So it's sometimes also used to describe um, um, African American civil rights um, and especially affirmative action as a special rights, right? Who are these special people to get special rights? It's a really interesting recasting. So suddenly, a history of structural discrimination around race, a history of structural discrimination around sexuality, around gender, in the case of transgender people, is, well, they're asking for special things. And so who in here is just the ordinary guy who's at risk of having his rights taken away, right? So it reconstructs who's the victim, or who is at risk of oppression and discrimination. And the other fascinating thing about the success of special, the language of special rights is the following. In 2011, there was a national survey of attitudes towards discrimination against LGBT people. So not the question of same-sex marriage. This poll was not about same-sex marriage. And in this poll, 73% of the adults polled, all voting age and above, were in favor of laws banning discrimination in the workplace on the basis of sexuality or gender identity. So they're basically they're in favor of laws that would bar discrimination against LGBT people just on the basis of who they were. So you think, wow, 73%. That's actually amazing. And the other interesting thing about the survey is that people were against discrimination, this large, large majority, even in cases where a, a significant number of the same people against discrimination were also opposed morally to homosexuality. So they asked additional questions of the people. So you had people against homosexuality morally, but they still thought it was unfair and wrong to discriminate. Again, that's actually amazing. I mean, these are the kinds of fine distinctions that are necessary to a life with others, that I can disagree morally but still think that as a matter of fairness, you should have the right to be and act as who you are, okay? Now here's where it gets really complicated. In this same poll, again, 73% of people say you shouldn't be able to discriminate against LGBT people. 90% of people, so an even larger percentage who thought that LGBT discri anti discrimination was wrong, right? 90% of the people polled thought that the law already um, said it was illegal to discriminate on that basis. So 90% of the people polled thought there was already a law in the books that protected LGBT people from discrimination at the federal level. There is not. Right? Um, there have been attempts to pass such a law since the 1970s that has stalled. Right? There's a law pending still in Congress called ENDA, Employment Non-Discrimination Act. But it's extraordinary. So 90% of the American, of, uh, you could extrapolate, so 90%, a large share of Americans believe that it's already legal at the federal level to discriminate against LGBT people. If you believe that, then it's much easier to believe that when LGBT people ask for equal rights, we must be asking for something special because we already have equal rights. Right? So this um, false notion of the kinds of legal protections already afforded in the basis of sexuality and gender identity helps contribute to a willingness to believe, again, that these folks are asking for something special. So I'm now on the outs. My values are under attack. I'm at risk of losing something. Right? This is really crucial because it helps to explain this other very fascinating phenomenon that's been going on in U.S. public life, where you hear um, many U.S. evangelicals, and some Catholics too, 
over the last two decades, it started with the evangelicals, right? You hear many U.S. evangelicals are claiming that they are under attack and marginalized by a dominant secular culture. Um, if you think about the claims about the war on Christmas, for example, right? And this sense of being under attack, that one's dearest held values are at risk of being dissipated by dangerous difference. I mean, that's one of the things we actually saw just now in that video. You know, instead of dismissing such claims out of hand, right, as so much political rhetoric or bad faith, pun intended, what if we take these claims at face value, right? Actually to look in the face of those who feel outrage, who feel at risk, who feel like they're about to be deprived of something, right? To take their feelings seriously. Now taking these feelings seriously, wants to install things, um, it's busy. Um, taking these claims seriously um, doesn't mean that we grant them at the level of fact or accuracy, right? We have to evaluate them. We have to listen for the history of the larger social context within which feelings are constituted and within which feelings constitute people. That is, feelings make us up and they help make up our worlds. How do we then distinguish between feelings and facts? So here's another distinction to keep in mind, it's a crucial one, is the distinction between being minoritized, which I talked about earlier, right, being, that is being ascribed as a minority by dominant culture, and identifying oneself and one's group as in the minority. The same feeling structure can work and be put to work in different ways. I can feel minoritized, I can feel like I'm in the minority, but let's do some more parsing of these feelings. Think again of my earlier point about the multiple uses of anger. In the end, what or how we feel as individuals matters less than how feelings get taken up and plugged into social relations, plugging us in along the way, along the currents of politicized feeling. Now, what an individual or a group feels does matter deeply to them and should not be discounted, but different degrees of accuracy obtained. We have to develop um, an ability to sort through the accuracy of any feelings claims on our moral attention. So let me try to bring this point home in plainer language. Not so many Christians, to a large degree evangelicals, but some Catholics, as I mentioned as well, believe they are the most persecuted group in America it may seem astonishing. After all, Christians are by far the religious majority in the United States. But the individuals and organizations making this claim have a long list of complaints that include judicial decisions banning prayer in public schools and the legalization of abortion and homosexual sodomy. Um, oh, that quotes. Not surprisingly, the primary perpetrators of these injuries are named as feminists, homosexuals, secularists, and those activist judges who take their sides in court. And they're only activist judges if they take the wrong side. Right? To many Americans, this argument about persecuted Christians sounds self-serving. Nevertheless, the people who make these claims, we are the most persecuted, persecuted group of all, really do feel aggrieved. What can these arguments, what can these feelings of grievance tell us about social division and discrimination at the gut level, beneath consciousness? The terms of this dispute show that the line between fair and unfair, just and unjust, equality and discrimination is not, in, is not as neat and clean as it may first appear. Think back also to the statistic 90% of people in this poll thought that LGBT people were already protected from, federal, from discrimination at the federal level. Right? Both Christian conservatives and LGBT people say, say they experience discrimination in this example. Both groups sincerely believe this to be true. Both groups even produce evidence to prove their claims. But there is a crucial difference here. Christians are neither a minority nor are they persecuted in the US as a group, that is, as Christians. LGBT people, on the other hand, are both a minority group and are frequently victims of discrimination. This can be complicated. It is possible that an individual heterosexual or a white person, a Christian, can be discriminated against for his or her sexual orientation, race, or religious belief or practice. And they have recourse under the law to address that discrimination. But anti-discrimination laws are written to protect minoritized groups. So why do people in these majority groups feel oppressed as a group? And here's speculation as to why. If you belong to a group that has traditionally enjoyed unquestioned <coughs> social dominance, any expansion of fairness for historically marginalized groups, such as people of color, LGBT people, and non-Christians, might feel like a loss when you're taking for granted social privileges and legal positions are suddenly challenged. But we should not confuse this loss in social capital or sense of superiority over others 
with an actual loss in civil equality and freedom. And here we see actually precisely this confusion between a feeling state and legal claims. One of the things I was worried about, that the language of Brown v. Board of Education, the landmark legal decision, starts to sneak into public discussion, a confusion between feeling and what is actually fair, substantively. Freedom is a basic value of democracy, and freedom is also in everyone's interest, but it doesn't always feel good. The kind of freedom and moral engagement I'm arguing for this evening would also make room for expressions of hatred, expressions at the level of speech, expressions at the level of affect, not expressions at the level of the fist. So I'm talking about a freedom to hate affectively. What about public space for people who conscientiously or even stupidly object to homosexuality? Does democracy and moral engagement require this? Yes, it would. But under the constitutional promise of equal protection due process, this is the 14th Amendment, and under the First Amendment promises of religious freedom, homophobia, so much of which is driven by religious beliefs, could have no legislative result. You cannot enshrine a particular religious belief in the law as the secular laws. This does not amount to asking us to tolerate the views of the intolerant. Tolerance doesn't really fight the problem of hatred. It maintains the very structure of hierarchy and discrimination on which hatred is based, right? I mean, tolerance is often is talked about, well, we just, everything, we just have to make everything no. That's actually no, because it means we can't make actual moral distinctions any longer. We get to make moral distinctions, but that is, doesn't mean we don't um, allow people freedom to make different kinds of moral distinctions so long as this does not actually mean um, bodily injury. Um, democracy doesn't require each of us to truly accept everyone else. It requires that we grant everyone else their rights and freedoms. <coughs> One of the reasons it's often hard for people to respond positively to diversity and, and to recognize other people's freedoms is because we conflate total acceptance with basic rights. But we don't have to agree with everyone. We don't even have to like everyone. We don't, but we do have to grant them freedom. In that way, people don't have to feel like they're giving up their own principles when they grant others the freedom to act on their diverse principles, that is, the principles that differ from mine, from yours. Americans are reluctant to accept differing concepts of morality in the name of freedom for all. And one of the reasons for this is that they feel they must somehow compromise their own beliefs to allow others the right to theirs. This is not necessarily the case. But I also think that this fear has to do with, again, deeper, I think, um, <clears throat> psychic reasons which have to do with the ways in which um, we disavow our, our interdependence with others. We actually disavow the ways in which difference is not out there, difference is always already in here. Uh, and when we're shown un, sort of um, undeniable examples of difference, we flee from them because they remind us of our own difference from ourselves. Right? There's a kind of flash card of difference, we can't deal with it. So we dump our fear of our difference onto these others and turn them into the fearful others. Who are, who, are, who are threats to us. It's sort of dump, like psychoanalysis has a language for this, a dumping, a projection. We dump, you know, we don't dump, just dump bad things. Usually we talk about dump, like I project my bad shit onto you, right? Excuse my language, but that's what you do, is just dump, right? And, and actually a lot of the language comes actually from thinking about expiratory functions. So I'm just giving you my crap. But we also dump good feelings. Like, oh, I feel so good about you. And I'm feeling good about myself when I do so, right? I mean, so it's a uh, projection is a um, can create great interference, but the kinds of interference in terms of seeing the other in her is different from oneself, but that interference can involve good feelings as well as, as bad feelings, right? Um, what would democratic engagement with difference look like and feel like in practice? And how might it require giving up mourning the fantasy of a world without conflict and of, without conflict and of identity without any remainder? To return to an earlier point, democracy on these agonistic terms probably wouldn't feel so good. But social relations on scales large and small are not only about beautiful feelings and everything going your way. Apologies to Rogers and Harrison. This is among the reasons we need courts to protect the rights of unpopular minorities from the sentiments of majority rules. Now, even in movements for LGBT rights, we often find an inability to accept diversity, to acknowledge the various ways people have developed for being gay, for doing something they would call gay. And debates among gay men and lesbians over whether or not same-sex marriage is even a desirable goal with these one such example. The dirty little secret, right, is that many LGBT people are, think that maybe the marriage freedom movement um, isn't as radical as it's presented as being. And think that marriage is too conservative a goal. It actually isn't freedom enough, which I'd be happy to talk about. But 
there's a stifling of such debates. We're not allowed to talk about them in public. So I'm, already, I'm happy to talk about this debate in public. Difference is the starting point of political movement, not the stumbling block. To repeat a point made earlier, albeit with a quick twist, difference in relation is also the starting point of life. There is no absolute pure difference. In life, I am never sealed off from you. My body does not exist apart from those other bodies that prop and support my own. Enlightenment fantasies of the autonomous private individual self, notwithstanding, even Immanuel Kant had a housekeeper. His life was propped on some many others. Only in death do we part our ways. To say that my body leans up against another's and another's from the beginning as my beginning complicates conversations about difference and identity. How do we hold in our heads same and different the both and of our lives with others? As legal scholar Patricia J. Williams puts it in her gorgeous book, which I highly recommend, um, The Alchemy of Race and Rights, she writes that although seeing simultaneously yet differently is more easily done in company, you see one thing, I see another, one person can get the hang of it with time and effort. It takes practice, 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 like getting to Carnegie Hall. This double vision, this capacity to see the same and different without collapsing the space between, nor denying relationality, is the queer optic as well of the poet Pat Parker's opening gambit in her marvelous poem, For the White Person Who Wants to Be My Friend. She writes, the first thing you do is forget that I'm black. Second, you must never forget that I'm black. Yes, and yes. Recognizing differences in their wild multiplicity does not, or at least need not, set up barriers to contact in making common cause across difference. Nor should we assume this contact always or only feels good. I keep pointing this out because it's just one of these things, it's just insufficient acknowledged. The leap of faith to live alongside others different from yourselves and to open yourself to all the ways you are different or could be different from the person you thought you had to be is not the slim hand of tolerance any more than it is the big feet of empathy where I stand in your shoes and see things from your perspective. Empathy is often invoked as a profound moral response to difference, what we need to do or offer so that we can, for example, feel someone else's pain as our own. There are a couple things to say here. First, empathy is not always the response to witnessing another's pain or suffering. We could be bored. We could be so inundated with such images that we just take the remote control and change channels. Second, although empathy is better than indifference or tolerance or open hostility, <coughs> Is it really the best response we can offer to another? In reality, we can't just cross over to the space of another and feel her pain. Lovely fantasy. But in reality, we actually cannot do that. To do so, to think we can do so, is to risk the colonization of the other's feelings. It's also to risk missing the other by mistaking her or him for ourselves. And aren't I magnificent? Psychoanalyst Christopher Bolas underscores how this kind of narcissistic projection of the self into the other evacuates the object, the other, and yet may be culturally redeemed as a form of knowing the other. I dump myself into you. I find myself in you. I disappeared you. But it's redeemed as an act of great moral imagination. I have empathized. But what kind of knowledge is this? Moral knowledge, epistemic knowledge, what kind of knowledge is this that can dispense with or see through the integrity of the object, of the person I'm supposedly looking at, even in the face? <coughs> in Bolus's bracing words, quote, projection as evacuation is only possible if the integrity of the object, the person with whom I'm engaged, is of no interest to the self, in which case any object will do as, very relevant terms, a psychic toilet. He really means it when he says evacuation. As against this way of seeing, or rather <coughs> not seeing the object other, Bolas offers a theory of what he calls perceptive identification, which is based on the self's ability to perceive the object as a thing in itself, separate from me, yet connected in some perhaps ultimately mysterious way. Not always mysterious, but maybe irreducible. We can't always know it fully. If the self can do this, if it can perceive the object as, th as this thing in itself, it then can enjoy the object's qualities and be nurtured by the integrity of the object. I can let it contact me in surprising ways. Perceptive identification is the ground process for a wider range and greater depth of intimacy with the object as other, 
by perceiving the object's features, its otherness. The object is love for itself, not for oneself. And importantly, an object's integrity is not the same thing as unity. This is a recognition, again, of the ways in which we are always split from the start, filled with differences we can't quite accommodate. But this is the multitude of our psychic life. Bowles is here thinking with another important figure in the history of psychoanalysis, Donald Winnicott, to flag the necessary otherness of the object, the way it both pre-exists and survives our encounter with it, even if we may act as if we invented it on the spot. But this as if is also important, even necessary. In Winnicott's language, it is an intermediate area of experiencing an enchanted play space within which the subject to be learns the difference and the ongoing overlap. I want to stress here the touch between self and the world of objects. And objects can be people and other animate creatures too. David and I were talking about dogs and cats. Last week. Turtles, why not turtles? This touch does not always feel good. Or reminds us again and again of the existence of an other within our reach, and yet beyond our ultimate grasp, a tensile point that gives the lie to destructive fantasies of control, homogeneity, and absolute autonomy. But this capacity to see and feel the object as a thing in itself must be learned and practiced, and throughout a life, not once for all. There are no guarantees, just the necessary risk of living alongside others we can never fully know, and may never even like. But so what? Get it out and get it over with, get over it, so we can get on with the hard work of composing and recomposing and sharing the world. Thank you for sharing your time with me. Questions, hysterical objections, non hysterical objections? Yes. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about the um, advertisement that you shared. And one of the things that I found really unsettling was the gender bias yes, yes. in the representation of the gay couples. It was completely male gay couples. Lesbians did not exist in the imagination no, of the sand. Not at all. Why, so why do you, do you have a thought about why that might be? Because um, even, I mean, all of every, it was all about man plus man when they were talking about same sex marriage. It's the Dan stick Michael, figures were right? the, the two princes, right. the King illustrations King, right? of the the couple that was imposing on the church mm -hmm. that was adopting mm -hmm. the board. Right. It was just really interesting, and I, I, I don't have any theories around it, but I was, it was kind of like a subtext mm -hmm. gender bias right. within the prejudice. Right. And it's also, it's, that's a great pickup, because it also, if you think about the couple, the heterosexual couple, are also Jan and Tom, right, are presented as pretty gender normative. Right, in terms of what, you know, we see Jan cooking, um, talking to her sister. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which we have a very gender normative frame for this as well. So something about homosexuality, male homosexuality, disturbs this gender normative frame in a way that maybe lesbianism couldn't, right? Um, other, other thoughts about this? Because, you know, this is uh, a very important thing to notice. The back. Uh, yeah, to kind of go on what Kent was saying, the fact that that ad was looking at the general between a man and a woman very normally, you know, the woman cooking, the man kind of doing the yard work. And on the other hand, you have these very like normal looking Jan and Tom. The way that I'm thinking about it is perhaps that why the out lesbian um, concept was included is the fact that perhaps we as in, in America see as the lesbian as a more sexually desirable object than we would be as a homosexual between two males. Mm -hmm. We see that a very in a very shocking nature it, it disturbs us. Not in the same way that a lesbian couple would. I mean, this is a very twisted American mm -hmm. ideal that we like fantasize about lesbians, but you know, totally. I fall. fantasize about lesbians, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we truly really abhor, you know, the male male encounter. Yeah. So on one, on one side, it was kind of getting to the, uh, to the heart of these, you know, regular couple, and on the other hand, it was just like, now I got you, now let me discuss you. So. I mean, the paradox is that, I mean, the, I mean there's a whole genre of, of heter pornography aimed at heterosexual men that features two women getting it on. But it's both, and, and, but it's foreplay, right? Because it's not real sex, because there's always a man that has to come into the scene to complete it. Whether actually bringing in uh, a male actor into the scene, the pornographic scene, or the man who's at home watching it, right, is completing it himself, right? So, the, so lesbian sex is here, uh, you know, often features as a pornographic fantasy um, for heterosexual male pleasure. So there's not a sexual autonomy granted to lesbians as such. So they can't, in some sense, they can't be scary in the same way, but it's actually a larger problem to do with female sexuality. Women are not actually given the same sort of agency 
who had to give the same kind of agency over their sexuality as men are presumed to have. So, I mean, you can even just say, so put it this way, schematically, um, as long as a woman is willing to sleep with one man, she can't even be a lesbian. Right? She might not even get to be bisexual. I mean, her self-identification as lesbian or bisexual is disqualified by the fact she makes herself sexually available to one man. Because it is men who determine her sexual subjectivity. She's an object to be desired, not someone who gets to, to actually define herself and desire in her own right. And so, I mean, this has an impact, on, I think, on all, um, all those who get identified as women. Right? Um, it's not just about those who identify as or are identified as women, as lesbians. Um, but it's, so the ad, this ad cannot imagine lesbians because they, they are not, in that sense, they wouldn't be disruptive enough to the gender normative economy. Because for all we know, you know, when Tom's out doing yard work, he's actually, you know, downloading lesbian porn. Right? That would be utterly gender normative right? for male heterosexuality. I'm not saying that all male heterosexuals do this, but it's part of it. It's, it's would not be considered in some, at all disruptive of the structure of heterosexual male desire to do that. And one of their main arguments was that um, the the gay couple couldn't be um, part of traditional family values and raise a child, whereas maybe it could be seen as two women could fulfill that role successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps because of the ways in which women get over-identified with, with um, maternalism, right? And their terms. Um, that's also possible. Yeah, so because, you know, it's also the, the cultural stereotype, which is not true, I hasten to add, that somehow, um, that homosexuals, especially homosexual men, are, uh, are sexual predators, right? They're, so the children are at risk from sexual of molestation from, um, from gay men. This just is not true. Um, we know this from any number of studies, right? It's just not true. Um, children are most at risk from family members or friends of families. Um, so in fact, traditional families are the place where um, children are most, potentially most at risk. Um, but um, the, the, the cultural stereotype of the, who's the scary, you know, sort of who's the scary man who's gonna do something to your children, it's not <coughs> a lesbian. Um, although just the open presence of a lesbian could you know, make uh, some, uh, some young girl decide she wants to grow up and be one, right? Um, there's that, right? Uh, the, sort of the, the scary role model. I'm doing my best to recruit. Um, I, actually, I'm not interested in, I want people to grow up and be, you know, able to think critically. I think that's the scariest recruit, recruitment of them all, right? Just be able to grow up and think critically um, and outside the box. That's what queerness is. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm remembering this exactly right, but uh, going back to what you were talking about before about sort of the personal relationship between, you know, this traditional nuclear family and, and gay neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, and it shows all their faces. And then when they move outside of that, to the structures of society, whether it's what's happening in the second grade class or what happens in churches, it's all silhouetted, non-faced figures. And I mean, going back to Levinas, right? I mean, the face is what has the possibility of disturbing and interrupting and in a very positive way, right. in that it calls me to ethical response. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, all these things in terms of what could go wrong, right. we're all sort of this depersonalized, um, silhouetted, abstraction of what might happen in the second grade class or in, in religious communities and such. It no longer has a link to that particular and the personal. And that's, according to Levinas, the, the very way that ethics breaks down is when you turn it into a structural, societal, moral issue rather than your neighbor. Huh. That's fascinating because it, cause what they're pointing out, and I, actually that's really, <laughs> that's so amazing. Because the ad, part of what this ad is doing, right, it wants to convince you, right, you could vote for Prop 8, your, your, your best friends, right? It says they've talked about the, there's a great friendship between these two families, right? You can vote for Proposition 8, so you're voting against your best friends, but you're still a good person because you're standing up for your values, right? So, what's really fascinating is that it's constructing this personal relation as one in which the faces are seen, right? Oh, we still, we, we, we don't, we still like them as people, we don't have to support their lifestyle. We see them fully, but we're voting to discriminate against them. So, the, it's the impersonal, I mean, it's really interesting, right? So that here, the face is a space of, of an ethics that can justify acting, I think, unethically. So it's, it, it really, it, again, I think it's, I don't know that uh, these folks have not read Levinas, that's my hunch. Um, but it's reversing the structure, because one of the things we've heard, it's said over and over again, that one of the ways that, um, that the law cannot legislate what is in the hearts and minds, right? This is frequently, 
it's um, stated by courts, right? It is not for the law to change what's in the hearts and minds. That is actually what activists do. That's what we do in interpersonal encounters. So it is about what happens between neighbors. It's what happens with your office mates. It's what happens when you sit in a classroom next to each other in the dining hall, right? That's actually the space of ethical encounter where change starts. It doesn't end there. It starts, right? Um, so this is telling a really different story about what kind of change. Uh, that's just, that's really interesting. Um, and again, I think they have an intuition, right? They have a moral intuition about that. Because again, we're told that's where change happens. So this is why uh, Americans are becoming more uh, supportive of lesbian and gay rights, of, of same-sex marriage, because they feel like they know a gay person. Even if they don't, they have to watch one on TV, right? Or they know gay people at work. They know neighbors, right? So here is where knowing doesn't have to, it can still allow you to say no. Very, very interesting. Yeah. I think it's interesting, um, just going back to the end, um, as interesting as, as uh, what, it, what it said um, the two families did together um, was what they didn't do. Um, so I noticed that it was totally fine for the, uh, the gay couple to watch the dog when they were on vacation. They didn't mention, you know, when Tom and Jan go on date. Right, no babysitting. They, right. They're not babysitting. And when someone, uh, when one of the, uh, a member of the gay couple was sick, someone came over to their house to visit them. They weren't coming over there. Um, and it was. Um, it's brought soup. Jan brought soup. Yeah, oh. absolutely. Jan brought soup over there. Um, so I don't know, just the idea that, um, and, and it made sense to me later because it was when they drew the um, connection. Uh, <laughs> saying that they were so opposed to you know, gay couples being able to adopt children. Um, it made sense to me then, but just those things that were implicit, even when they're showing the faces of these people, they're showing how this um, interaction happens on a very personal level, there's still that, that level of bias, and when you're watching it, just kind of, it, it didn't sound so appropriate. Yeah, there's a lot of coding happening in that. I mean, just a few other factual inaccuracies that I think are important in that ad, because Again, it's about the construction of special rights also, and also telling us a story, like this is a story told from the perspective of those who feel like they are under threat. So, so particular religious values will be under threat if same-sex marriage is legalized, um, or if it's allowed to remain legalized in the state of California. And um, one of the claims it made, you know, like there's, here the male narrator's voice, I think also important, though it's a friendly voice, but kind of youngish. Um, accent neutral, but wondering, you know, Jan and Tom wonder, well, will our churches be forced to recognize and perform same-sex marriages? Now, that is a settled legal question. No, they will not. As a matter of law, right, um, and this, you know, churches, synagogues, mosques are exempt from this particular requirement. No church can be forced to perform a particular ritual that violates the tenets of its tradition. And that's a matter of religious freedom, because that would be the state actually establishing religion and dictating the forms of worship and practice. So as a matter of settled law, no religious organization could be forced to perform a same-sex marriage. But then it gets complicated, because what if you work for a religiously affiliated employer? Um, is that employer, in the state of Massachusetts, say, is that employer required to give you um, equal treatment for health insurance for your legally recognized spouse in the state of Massachusetts? Yes, that employer is. It's a religiously affiliated. If it's a church you actually work for, no, it's not. Right? So there's been this really interesting fine tuning around uh, the exemption of religious organizations, which ones, from otherwise um, applicable state laws having to do with anti discrimination. And it, I mean, I think we could have another kind of conversation. Um, this is something uh, I've written about in one of the new books that's coming out um, in August. Uh, the book, um, you can tell just by looking into any other myths about LGBT life and people. Um, why does religion get a hall pass, as it were? Um, why is religion giving special treatment such that religious organizations can be exempt from otherwise applicable state anti-discrimination laws? I mean, I am so on board with the idea that you could never require that a um, church must synagogue, that a religion um, re change its, um, its practice, like a, its sacraments, if you're going to use Christian language, to recognize same-sex marriage if it's against the, the tenets of that tradition. But that's a different thing from whether or not a religious organization can be allowed to discriminate when no other organization, when a secular organization, could not. Why? Right? And I actually mean that as a genuine question. 
what makes religion special, such that it, it gets a hall pass. Um, and this is a really important question, again, for how do we live next to each other's uncomfortable difference, because historically, uh, there was an earlier moment where religion asked for a hall pass around racial discrimination. And it's because of social activism that is now generally accepted as one of the norms of a, a, this is a norm, this is ethically normative, and now legally so too, but first it had to become ethically normative as a shared principle of life in the United States that you could not, on the basis of religion, discriminate against someone, or you could not use religion as your justification for racial discrimination. That became first an ethically normative principle before it became enshrined in law. Um, and the case that, um, where the law said, okay, there's been enough movement out there um, in public, enough transformation um, to do with laws, and laws that say segregation is illegal, even if segregation continues in practice, right? So a case comes before the Supreme Court to do with Bob Jones University. Do people know about this case? Bob Jones University, a fundamentalist university um, that banned interracial dating. So any student on campus um, that um, was, found, was discovered to be dating a person of another quote race, I say quote race because what does this also mean? How are these categories being identified? If you were discovered to be identified, uh, dating someone of, of, of another race, you would be expelled from the school, right? So it was, um, in violation, eventually, as federal policies changed about segregation and what sort of, sort of things were permissible and impermissible, eventually Bob Jones University, which had this policy for a long time, 50 years, eventually it became against the law. So, but Bob Jones wanted to say, but no, we're doing it on religious grounds. It's protected on the basis of First Amendment religious freedom. The state cannot coerce our religious beliefs. We think racial segregation is actually mandated in the Bible. That's right, it's scriptural interpretation. So they want to say, because of religion, we can do this. Now, it's not never the law's um, job to decide whether or not a religious belief is correct or not. That's not its job. It's trying to figure out whether or not a practice interferes with other recognized rights in the Lewis Balancing Act. So the IRS basically removed from Bob Jones its tax-exempt status as a university gets tax-exempt status, a nonprofit. And this has huge implications for um, Financial implications for Bob Jones University. Bob, so Bob Jones University sues, makes its way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says unanimously, no, Bob Jones University, you are not legally allowed to discriminate on the basis of race by expelling students involved in an interracial relationship. This is after the Supreme Court said association laws are not permissible. You're not legally allowed to do this and claim religion as your grounds. So since 1982, I think Bob Jones was in 1982, is it matter of law, you cannot use religion to justify racial discrimination. You can, however, use religion to justify discrimination on the basis of sexuality and gender. Now, it's an interesting question when or if even that will change. Because of the ways in which religion gets in the business of gender and sexuality, far more often than it gets in the business of race. Right? Um, but it, this is going to become, this is the issue that will be confronting us legally. It's already confronting us to do with contraceptive care and the affordable and the and national health care. Right? Religious exemptions are being claimed not just by churches, but by religiously affiliated organizations, and by private employers who say they have religious objections to being forced to pay contraceptives for, for women who are working them, right? So that's a religious exemption claim. It'll be really interesting to see those court cases are gonna hit the Supreme Court um, probably two years from now. And we're gonna see more and more such claims being made around same-sex marriage once more states recognize it, right? To me, these are the threshold issues to do with how exactly are we going to make these moral negotiations and make space to be vibrantly different, religiously, ethically? We don't have to be relig you know, religious to be ethical, right? And this is, what, this is going to be one of the places to see just how much we can actually bump up against people who are radically different in the way that they produce their lives. It's like a downer moment. I'm not really optimistic about what the Supreme Court will do in these cases at all. But the other thing to remember is that it's a mistake to think that we have to pitch our arguments to the law. If I'm a lawyer, I have to do so. Like if I'm going to go in and argue the Supreme Court around DOMA or Prop 8, I have to use the language the court will recognize because it thinks in terms of precedent. It wants to rule as narrowly as possible. It wants everything to line up with how it's um, developed legal principles in the past. So I have to make certain kinds of arguments that I might not even believe in. But I have to make an argument that they can hear that's legible to law. 
But most of our arguments in public life aren't with the law. And it's a mistake to speak to the law. If we speak to the law, we, can, we actually get to speak in very narrow terms. It's better to speak to each other, even if we speak at high volume. Because that's the real rub of it, right? One of the mistakes, I think, of LGBT politics is there's been too much of a pitch to law um, in recent years. Um, as if that will solve what are much bigger problems to do with um, making a case for the morality of homosexuality. Right? Religious exemptions are going to keep appearing as a problem because that case has not yet been made. Using the language of rights has taken it out of the language of values. I think the language of values is much more important because that's about creating, I think, more space to actually disagree and survive our disagreement. People think disagreement will kill them. So, well, maybe this is my second life, right? I'm the experience, but you've got this experience where you're, oh my gosh, this experience is making me crazy. Right. Yeah, it should be. Uh, you survived it. It's like good practice surviving it every day. And then you learn from surviving it. Families are good for. <laughs> they for many things, but that's one of the things families are good for. Classrooms too, a very good day. Good disagreement. Excellent.